So welcome everybody uh, and special welcome to uh, Maria. Uh, Maria. Maria de la Cuesta at least is on the, but it's, it's a little bit longer the name. So uh, Maria de la Cuesta, pause, pa, pa, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, so these are the limitations of intercultural exchange. So uh, Maria, welcome. Uh, I'm very happy that you agreed to uh, give a talk uh, in, uh, in, our, um, in the center of Amsterdam, um, in the Amsterdam Center for Transformative Private Law uh, in one of its uh, external uh, lecture series. Um, and it is really great pleasure because I think that your topic really uh, um, goes into one of the core issues that we are interested in here uh, at the center, namely uh, the interrelation between uh, uh, global economy and how it is constituted and private law uh, on the other hand. So really, really great that you are here. Uh, so just a little bit background with regard uh, to Maria. So Maria has uh, done her, uh, her PhD at the EUI. Uh, accidentally with the same supervisor as I did. Uh, so uh, there is connection also there, except for the name. Uh, and um, I think that, that I've heard about Maria's PhD much earlier than I heard about her. So I have first heard about the PhD and then uh, um, uh, about uh, the person. So it's very, it's my really great pleasure that she accepted uh, to join us here today because uh, because her PhD uh, on uh, SMEs in glo uh, in food chains, in global food chains, uh, is is really uh, quite quite um, quite a groundbreaking uh, piece of work uh, from what I've heard. And the paper she's going to present today is a chapter from the thesis, uh, which is going to be, however, uh, adjusted uh, or reworked into, into a self-standing publication. So I think that that, that means that our, our comments uh, uh, can, can um, do, some, do some, uh, some good. So uh, without further ado, I will give floor to Maria. Uh, we know uh, the rest. Uh, whoever would like to pose a question, just write a question in the chat uh, and, and we take it from there into Q&As. I think Maria will talk about 30 minutes around about uh, and uh, yeah, that's all, uh, and we give now floor to Maria. Thank you very much. I will start sharing my slides. Here it goes. Yes, perfect. Can you all see them properly, or you see maybe their faces on there? Yes. <laughs> perfect. So I will start by saying thank you for your kind words, Maria, but also for the opportunity to be presenting here today. Of course, I would have loved to be in person in Amsterdam with you and share this moment with you, but at this moment, I think we are all hoping that things start getting back to normal little by little and that in the meanwhile, we all stay safe. So I'm going to start my presentation with some, um, wait, let me move, yes. <laughs> with some uh, general introductory remarks on myself, on my PhD thesis, and also on my current work. So as Maria said, my complete name is Maria Paz de la Cuesta de los Motos, but Maria just is going to work as well. And I defended my PhD at the European University Institute about one year ago already, a little bit more than one year. And today I'm mainly going to present the main findings of my, of my thesis, in which I was investigating the extent to which the transformation of the global economy into global value chains has brought about radical changes, I would say, into categories, traditional categories of the member states, including contract competition and also for trading. At the same time, the global value chain has opened leeway for regulation by means of contract, by the elaboration of codes of conduct, standards, uh, compliance mechanisms, labels, etc. And one of the arguments of my thesis is that this has also allowed the European Union to use co-regulation by means of contract in global value chains to manage persistent differences in the approaches to the regulation of fair trading across member states. For this reason, my thesis was very much focused on the regulation of unfair trading practices in Europe and in the elaboration and the whole process leading to the adoption 
of the 2019 Directive on Business to Business and Fair Trading Practices in the Food Supply Chain. As I said, I believe that this uh, directive is part of a broader tendency that can be seen in the evolution of private law in Europe that would be marked by what I consider three main elements, which would be the uh, definition of a small and medium enterprises or small businesses more generally as a protected status of private laws, very much in the image of European consumers. A second element would be the a new sort of brand of fair trade, which would sometimes vaguely identify with sustainability. And finally, a radical transformation of enforcement that moves away from national courts and puts more and more emphasis on agencies, mediation, and anticipated forms of enforcement. As I have said, my PhD was very much focused on this European dimension and on this understanding of unfair trading practices. But as I have started working on transforming this thesis into a self-standing publication, a question keeps coming to my mind and I will take the liberty to use your brains today. So I will really welcome your feedback on, this, on these issues, which is how can this eminently and essentially European instrument, which is very much addressed at the protection of European producers, be used also to regulate that external dimension of value chains. And finally, I would like to add some words on the approach I try to take in my business and, and that I will also use in this, in, the, in this presentation today, which is a bottom-up approach. And what do I mean by this? Well, much of the um, literature on global value chains takes an, a macro approach that looks at the activities of lead firms, those big multinationals that contract with uh, all kinds of economic actors across borders, across jurisdictions. And they look at how, what are the corporate and contract governance instruments that they use to uh, regulate and govern different aspects of production and consumption in a global environment. Instead, I want to look at the figure of that a small producer or a small business, which is at the heart of the directive. And to do so, in the next part of my thesis, of my presentation, sorry, uh, quoting a famous French uh, author, Contrat de Montmoulin, I will now uh, try to substantiate this uh, bottom-up approach. And here you have a picture of the farm where I grew up. I thought this was a nice way of uh, illustrating some of the questions on unfair trading practices that I treat on my thesis and I want to discuss today. Not because this is my form, but because it allows me to, to, to understand or to start from the contractual practices in which my farm can get involved too, to see to what extent uh, it can, it, and in, on what conditions small, producers and small farms can access global value chains and what type of unfair trading practices they may be exposed to and ultimately how can they protect themselves from these type of practices. So to give you a little bit background on my farm, <laughs> it is actually located in the middle north of Spain, in the middle of the Castilian plateau. So this means it is exposed to a continental climate with very cold winters and very hot summers. And in terms of size, in terms of surface, it can be considered a middle-sized farm with around 400 hectares. But in terms of employees, it employs two people on a permanent basis. So it is considered a small and medium enterprise. And it participates thanks to our to the employees, but also thanks to this climate, it can participate in very different types of food chains from the local to the global. We produce, for example, chickpeas that we sell to neighboring villages on a very informal kind of way because our chickpeas have developed some sort of uh, reputation for quality in the neighboring uh, in the neighborhood. 
but we also participate in more complex value chains. For example, we produce lentils under a protected indication of origin. We have recently started producing pistachios. And also we produce sugar beet, which is where uh, the value chain that I'm going to use today as an example to discuss and for trading practices with you. Because the, uh, oh, these are the works on this street that I was talking about before. I hope they are not too, <laughs> too loud. And as I was telling you, the sugar value chain is an amazingly complex value chain that um, serves as a very good starting point to discuss uh, unfair trading practices in a global scenario. So moving on. And because I'm a little bit of a history nerd, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on the history of sugar. I think it's interesting and fascinating because you can see how sugar has always been connected to global issues of production. Now, I'm going to have a little bit of a water break here. So, Will, Europeans always were in love with sugar and they first encountered sugar uh, during the Crusades. This sugar came from India, where sh sugar cane is native to, but uh, the difficulties of trade with India always made sugar in the, across the Middle Ages a very expensive and exclusive uh, item of consumption, which meant that it remained very rare in the European market until Christopher Columbus had the brilliant idea of taking sugar cane in his second trip to the Americas and planted sugar cane in La Española, now Cuba, uh, in his second trip. And this, without knowing, started the global trade of sugar that uh, would uh, drive Europeans crazy about in the 1700s and that would make sugar ever more, uh, ever cheaper and ever more accessible to the European uh, consumers. And um, of course, this trade would also become inextricably linked to the history of colonialism and slavery and ecological degradation. And now we also know it, obesity. But trade of sugar started facing some difficulties across the Atlantic during the war between Great Britain and Napoleon. So the Brits blocked sugar trade, and that meant that Europeans had to start looking for alternative sources of sugar. And the answer came from Germany, where a German man of science had discovered that chard or the common beetroot contains sucrose. So European governments started investing money on research into this new into this variety to extract sugar from beetroots. And this is how the sugar beet industry it starts in Europe. For example, in 1811, Napoleon established sugar schools in France, compelled farmers in France to start planting sugar beet, and also some years later banned imports of sugar from the Caribbean. Like this, the European sugar industry uh, started blooming in competition with the American sugar cane, which started facing a period of decline, especially after the Haiti war, the end of the colonies in the Caribbean, and the abolition of slavery. In Spain, something similar happened after the Cuban-American War which meant that the, at the beginning of the 20th century, the sugar industry in Spain started developing. And about the 30s, my farm, as soon as, as far as I have been able to get back in time, started uh, uh, the first crop of sugar beets. After this brief history of sugar, which I personally find very interesting, <laughs> we can move on now to the structure of the sugar chain and to to understand what are the um, specific characteristics that, that drive um, governance mechanisms in the chain. And well, all plants, whether sugar cane or sugar beet, needs to be taken to factories and to go through a series of transformations, cutting, uh, evaporations and mechanisms until raw sugar and white sugar can be extracted. So the importance, the central importance of factories and of refineries 
and defined the structure of the chain because they create bottlenecks at the factory level in which farmers can face increasing uh, unfair trading uh, risks on, of unfair trading practices. At the production level, the main producers of sugar in Europe are France, Germany, the Netherlands, and I think also Poland. And in terms of size, most of the, the plantings of, of, uh, of sugar beet in Europe vary a lot across member states. In Spain, together with Poland and I think Austria, they are the smallest. And in other countries, uh, plantings and farms tend to be a little bit bigger. And since 2016, there is a tendency also towards increased concentration at the production level of the chain. At the level of the sugar industry, the factories, uh, the market has oligopolistic characteristics. So you have nine companies that control 89% of sugar production in Europe. From the perspective of my farm, this means that when we produce sugar beet, we can sell it either to a cod, which is a cooperative, either to uh, a zucarera, which is a single shareholder limited liability company owned by British Sugar. And um, in terms of the final steps of the chain, the 70% of sugar production goes to the food industry with buyers like Unilever, Coca-Cola, and Nestle. And the 30% goes to households via mainly uh, food retailers like Auchan, Carrefour, etc. So within this governance structure, the existence of operational bottlenecks at the factory level creates the risks for unfair trading practices against producers and farms. This risk is also exacerbated by other elements that are inherent to the production of sugar. For example, the high costs uh, related to the technology and to this access to the seeds of, uh, of sugar beet. They represent so much a cost for the producer that they are um, necessarily dependent on the sugar industry to provide these inputs. For example, the machines that are used to harvest it cost, I don't know how many millions. <laughs> and, and the same goes with the seeds. Seeds every year, they are constantly developing new varieties of seeds um, that are resistant to pests, that are resistant to, that are more efficient, that yield more sugar per ton. And, and this makes it a highly technological market where farmers need the support of the sugar industry. And on the global level, the market is also characterized by volatile prices. So a change, small changes in global prices uh, mean for farmers that they can face unilateral unexpected changes to their trading, uh, to their trading conditions in the contracts from the part of the sugar industry. And this is where the risk of unfair trading practices appears. How has the European Union approached the issue of unfair trading practices historically? The sugar industry, historically speaking, has been one of the most regulated agricultural sectors in Europe which meant that producers were relatively isolated from global markets. This system, the first uh, common market organization on sugar dates back to the 60s and it established a system of quotas and minimum prices. So the European Commission would establish the production quantities per member state and the, at the same time it would establish minimum prices. Um, that would guarantee a minimum return for producers. Until 2006, this system was working relatively well from the perspective of producers because it kept the market stable and out of quota surpluses in production would actually be self absorbed by the industry that would uh, destine them to non-food products like bioethanol or that would um, destine uh, this uh, surpluses to uh, exports to third countries 
without a subsidy, so at the global market price. But this system also created or generated lots of criticism. First, because it kind of isolated uh, farmers and producers from the need to innovate and become more and more competitive in global markets. And second, because it produced negative consequences for uh, trading partners like Brazil, Australia, and other uh, countries um, and other developing economies. So by 2016, a transition period to a new system started. The quotas were reduced and the minimum intervention and intervention prices were replaced by reference prices. And in 2017, the quota system disappeared. And at the same time, the new way of stabilizing the trading relations uh, started relying more and more on contract farming. So what are contract farming? What is contract farming? According to the Common Market Organization regulation, uh, the contracts between producers and the sugar industry have to follow a framework contract that is negotiated by the uh, producers organizations and associations of producer organizations together with the sugar industry. These agreements regulate purchasing conditions and most notably establish a minimum price for a period of four, five years, depending on the country. And at the same time, uh, establish different cooperation mechanisms on joint management of waste or um, other costs related to production, joint procurement of inputs like seeds and machinery, transportation, etc. Also, these framework agreements between the industry and the production contain references to mediation mechanisms. They establish also obligatory mediation, which in the case of Spain is administered directly by the Minister of Agriculture. And all in all, I have been telling you about the sugar value chain because I think it's a good starting point to see the way in which private governance by means of contracts in the value chain and in the food chain has been used to promote some sort of fair trading and stabilize relations between production and the sugar industry when there is risk of unfair trading practices. And in this sense, the adoption of the 2019 Directive on Unfair Trading Practices followed a little bit the same direction. Another water break. <laughs> the 2019 Directive has a very different uh, scope because it's not sectorial like the common market organization regulation which is addressed at agricultural production but instead applies to all actors along the food supply chain. First it specially approaches small and medium enterprises but it does not contain a direct definition of small business but rather uses a dynamic approach to questions of power imbalances. So the application of the directive depends on the differences in time over between contracting parties. And in terms of substance and what are the trading practices that are prohibited, the directive contains a list of prohibited practices like, for example, delay payments, unilateral changes to contract or unilateral cancellations uh, of for perishable uh, products and so on so forth, which are really not that innovative in the sense that these type of practices were already part of uh, sectorial codes of conduct that existed at the EU level and at the, and at the national level, and that member states over a period of, the, of 10 years have already been introducing into their, into their legislation, most member states except some like, uh, I think Belgium was the only one that hadn't done by two years ago. Now they have. But uh, the biggest change introduced by the Unfair Trading Practices Directive is its approach to enforcement, which is based on 
what I consider three main pillars. The first one would be the anticipation of enforcement because it specifically promotes the elaboration of codes of conduct and creation of this type of framework contracts or farming contracts that would need to anticipate the type of conflicts that can appear in the value chain and offer a cooperative approach. The second uh, pillar in the transformation of enforcement would be the move away from um, courts towards compliance mechanisms insofar as it establishes uh, mediation and it uh, promotes mediation and arbitration as alternative uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. And finally, also the directive um, goes very far in uh, promoting agentification or the administrativization of litigation because it uh, invites member states to designate different enforcement authorities that can have the power to receive anonymous complaints, to investigate unfair trading practices, and also to find uh, infringers. So the directive actually has to be transposed by next April by the member states. And it will become binding on all contracts celebrated in the uh, food value chain for 2022. So implementation, the implementation phase and the transposition phase of the directive becomes now key. And as member states develop its provisions, the question poses to what extent this transformation of enforcement is going to bring about changes in the behavior of economic actors in the chain. So I wanted, taking you back to the example of the sugar chain, I wanted, for example, to uh, bring an example about an ongoing conflict now between producers and the sugar industry in Spain, because even if framework contracts were working relatively well to stabilize uh, trading relations between producers and buyers, after 2018, global markets went a little bit crazy and the global price for sugar went down very rapidly due to over surplus of sugar production in India, especially, and in other developing countries. And for producers, this meant that their buyers, the sugar industry, stopped complying with the framework contract. In the case of Spain, this was especially the case of British Sugar and not so much of Accord, the other cooperative. And faced to this situation, farmers had two, maybe three options. They could just stop producing sugar beet and move to other crops. But this was not an option for the people that had recently made an investment in transforming into that type of crop, or they could just stick to that contract that was out of the framework agreement because British Sugar since 2018 withdrew from the framework agreement that is actually mandated by the Common Market Organization regulation. So it's in violation of the European, of the European regulation. Maria? But yes, sorry. We see your slide, Directive 2019. I think I'm not entirely sure if that's still the slide that you want to show us. Uh, yeah, I have very few slides, sorry. Ah, okay, no, <laughs> just checking, great. Thank you, thank you for letting me know. I just, I'm really hoping the noise is not making, uh, it's not being too distracting. It's fine. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, I was just using an example that I included in the slides, which is this uh, litigation between producers now and the sugar industry, especially British sugar. And as I was saying, British sugar just stepped out of the framework agreement. And uh, producers, some producers were left with no choice but to stick to contracts that are in violation of the European regulation. And yet there is no, um, there is the so-called fear factor, the prevalence of the fear factor, and the lack of litigation means against uh, British sugar, because the fear by farmers and the fear also by trade unions at this moment is that if they 
bring up a case, if they complain to British Sugar, British Sugar will quite simply say, okay, I close my factories in Spain. And all the jobs that are dependent on, on these factories will just disappear. So because that no one wants that to happen, this violation to the framework contract is allowed to go on. From this perspective, then how can how effective can the enforcement approach of the unfair trading practices directive be? In this sense, uh, some scholars like Kafaji and Yamicelli have really pointed out that in the transposition, transposition of the directive, member states should really use the leeway they're allowed to, to bring into a value chain approach that is not entirely present in the directive, in the sense the directive is very much focused on bilateral relations between contracting parties. And yet the remedies that are needed and the kind of approaches that are needed are very much dependent on the type of value chain and the type of governance structure that exists in a given, in a given product. Sadly, I don't think this has been the case of Spain with the transition. Maybe it has been the case in other member states, but this is something that we will have to see in the future. And now, not to conclude, because I would like these two points to give rise to further discussion. I just wanted to mention two brief things. The first one is, or the first one comes back to the question I started with. How can this uh, essentially European instrument, which is addressed at the protection mainly of European producers, be also used to regulate the external dimension of value chains? In this sense, I think that at least the directive brings about a change in the traditional way of looking at the relationship between the inside of European production and the outside, in the sense that traditionally there has been this divide between the overly protected, overly privileged European farmer and the underprivileged producers of, their, of, de, of developing economies. And in this sense, the unfair trading practices approach to fair trading makes the concept applicable to all actors independent of whether they are European or overseas suppliers, because the directive actually specifies in its recitals that the provisions and the prohibition of unfair trading practices also applies to overseas suppliers. If he, even if this is only to avoid uh, deviating trade from European small businesses to overseas suppliers. And there is a second element that I would like to discuss, which is the extent to which the directive cannot be looked at in isolation of the broader governance context in which the fair trade of the value chain in the sugar sector, for example, is not independent or isolated from other governance concerns like the sustainability of production, uh, the social rights of the workers in the chain, or the health concerns that affect also the, cons the excessive consumption of sugar in Europe. And here, for example, uh, one specific uh, element that is missing in the current discussion, I think, is putting together or bringing into context the approach to unfair trading practices that exist uh, and is present in this directive with the broader discussion on due diligence and due dil diligence uh, um, legislations in European member states. So this is it for the moment, not to conclude. And now I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. I will stop sharing it. Thank you, Maria. This was really wonderful. Uh, and I would like to ask Dean to stop recording.